Okay, I'd like to welcome you to this meeting of the Philoctetes Center, which is the fourth in the series we are doing to celebrate the uh, birth, uh, the 150th anniversary of Freud's birth. Uh, this one is on the role of uh, publications of the written word in the development of uh, psychoanalysis, its history, the present, how it's going, and what can we anticipate in the future. Uh, Dr. Daria Colombo, who is from New York Psychoanalytic Institute and from Cornell, will be moderating tonight's session and uh, she will introduce the uh, participants. She's going to be the editor of a new journal that Philoctetes is going to publish, which will hopefully see the light sometimes later this year. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ed. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I look forward to hearing from the panelists. And as a new editor, I look forward to learning from all of your experience. Let me introduce everyone briefly. Um, this is Dr. Peter Neubauer, editor of the Psychoanalytic Study of the Child. Paul Stepanski, managing editor of the Analytic Press, director of the Analytic Press. Um, Eliane de Rocha Barros, um, Latin America editor for the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. Steve Levy, editor of the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and um, Donald Stern, editor of Contemporary Psychoanalysis. Welcome. Um, I, got, I got your name right. Let me start maybe by throwing out a basic question. Uh, what do you think are the fundamental um, challenges facing psychoanalytic publishing today? Who would like to start? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I mean, in a way, that's an easy answer. Readership. Um, the, uh, the, the field is contracting, and um, Paul is really the one I think is going to have the most to say about this, but I know through Paul, because I have also have a book series at Analytic Press, and I am privy to disturbing news, which, which Paul will probably tell you about. <laughs> Paul's kind of put on the spot here. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, you know, I think most journals are, are experiencing a it's not true for the biggest journals. It's not true for, for, for JAPA, I guess. Well, the membership of JAPA, even, yeah, even sure the American sure has declined is. in membership, so JAPA does too. Um, but JAPA and the International of Psychoanalytic Psychology have very, very large captive audiences uh, compared to the rest of us. And, um, but everybody's seen a, a decline in, in subscriptions, and it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. At Contemporary Psychoanalysis, we have just hired a... We are an unusual journal. We, um, uh, we are probably, I guess the, the quarterly in a way is like us, but we are, uh, the journal is owned by the, the Institute and Society, the, the William Allison White Institute and the William Allison White Society, which is the society of its graduates. And we have 200 people. So this journal is gr growing from a, a very small organization. And um, uh, so we have always done our own advertising and promotion and all that sort of thing. Finally, though, because it's really it, it's absolutely dead necessary, we have hired uh, professional <coughs> advertisers and promotion people to do, uh, <coughs> to do the work for us that we really never did for ourselves very well. Um, and I suppose everybody faces this. I want to say something. Um, I agree that one of the problems is readership, but I think that there are other uh, questions as well. Uh, the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, for example, we have quite a, lot, uh, quite a number of subscribers, but I don't think that uh, a great number of the subscribers really read the <laughs> journal. <laughs> So we, we, we need to create conditions also for the people to get interested in what we publish. And I would say that uh, up to now, uh, our, uh, our stress was on uh, asking authors to state clearly their ideas and uh, to sustain by a uh, good argument. Nowadays, I would say that with the globalization, we have a new challenge. We have to uh, help people to understand each other as well. The big challenge is to, con uh, is to publish things that allow people to understand different uh, 
uh, styles, different schools of psychoanalysis, different ideas. And I think that we have not been paying real attention to that point uh, up to now. And I think that this, I'm talking also as a Latin American in some ways because I'm Brazilian, although I'm the editor of the Latin America editor of the International Journal. Uh, from the Latin American point of view, and I think from the experience we have in our cultures, which are much open to other uh, schools of thought, uh, is, uh, the Brazilians, the Latin Americans, they read quite a lot of the American analysts, of the Italian ones, of the Spanish, of the British. So we are much more open, and I think that there is a, de a demand for making, for creating conditions for the different uh, orientations to talk. Uh, I very much like to continue that kind of thought because I don't think it's a question of just distribution and how does one go about to make it uh, acceptable. If I think from a few point of the history of the psychoanalytic study of the child, which started in 1945, and it was there as an annual, as you know. It was there in order to address two questions. And I think in our discussion, we will want to consider these, these two separate from each other. One is, should we have a publication for those who want to and need to publish? Secondly, should we have a publication for the public? That is different. For whom do we publish? And if you publish for a certain section, how does that affect then our selection and our, our interest? Uh, the, in the beginning, we, particularly with the psychoanalytic study of the child, the, what one wants to publish was in the foreground of interest of those who studied it, Anna Freud and Hartmann and Freud, all these people. Because they said, we are at a point now in psychoanalysis in which we need a publication which addresses itself to the new advances which comes with the study of the child, with all its implications. And we need that for those who have studies, who do studies, and want to continue to explore that. It was very much part of the uh, interest in providing opportunities for others and share it with others, the new ideas. It is very interesting that about 30 years later, Hartmann shifted his position and he said, what is important for us in our acceptance of papers for publication is, re is really the, our interest to give the reader not only the opportunity to hear what some researchers and some theoreticians want to propose, but I want to give the readers the opportunity to confirm from their own clinical experience whether what they read makes sense to them or not. That it is there, he shifted to include them, the response for it. And that was very important because in order to, to, to give to the public at large the opportunity to understand what, let's say, the eco-psychology means now uh, uh, in, in their proposition, it should come from the observation, from the study of the people. And he says, I'm glad to accept papers for publication who do not bring about something new, but would bring about a shared experience of new proposition over a period of time. We have to have that. We, he wanted it very much. And there was really an interest in combining the research interest in the field, in particular with children, with the, its role it should play within the uh, psychoanalytic public at large. And I like to remind you the fact that the psychoanalytic study of the child came out in English had an important influence on the international scene. We forget that, how psychoanalytic uh, uh, publication huh, excludes a large part of people who otherwise are not able to really participate neither in reading nor in, 
in publication. But this is another point. Uh, I could go on and on, but let's stop. <laughs> Let me uh, jump in. My perspective is obviously quite different with respect to all of these issues, since I'm not editing one journal, but looking at the whole field day to day. Uh, psychoanalytic study of the child is an old war horse, and it really is the last surviving annual. You realize that. The era of the annual has come and gone. Psychoanalytic study of society, the annual of psychoanalysis, gone. Psychoanalytic study of the child was losing money for Yale University Press. They tried to get rid of it for many years. You realize that. So again, my small voice of reality would suggest that uh, you know it's all well and good to, to uh, conceptualize a publication like psychoanalytic study of child in terms of its educative value for people historic. in the field. It was a historical book. <laughs> it was a historical point. I'm, my, my question is, how many child care specialists outside of psychoanalysis do you feel you're engaging at this point in time? I suggest you can count them on your hands and toes. Uh, my perspective is this. Um, I question the, 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 the assumption with which you began that there is a field regarding which we can discuss intelligently publication-related issues. There hasn't been a field in more than a quarter of a century. Psychoanalysis is a congeries of part fields that has given rise to a congeries of part publications, analogous to part objects. There are part journals and there are part books. <laughs> Some of the parts at any one moment in history are more robust and engaging than others. Um, um, Self-psychology. Radical divisions you're saying cause these parts? I'm saying, I'm, I, don't, I don't think one can distinguish. I think there's an institutional embodiment of theoretical divisions within the field and the reason we have these divisions and the reason these divisions gain institutional expression is something that, in point of fact, I'm writing about right now. I mean, I think it's, it's subject to historical analysis, and I, and I think that analysis is, is going to be country-specific. So, you know, I'm not expert on what's happening overseas. Um, but, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to be the, the, uh, the voice of doom here. I, I, based on what I see, I don't think there can be a robust publication that encompasses all of the psychoanalyses at this point in time. I don't think it's, it's conceptually possible. May I comment what you just said? I, <laughs> <laughs> I am not so sure that everywhere the age of the annuals have ended. If I tell you about our experiences in the International Journal. Besides the International Journal, we publish what we call Libro Anual, Annual Book of Psychoanalysis. Now we are publishing in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, very soon in Russian, and very likely in Chinese in some time. Uh, in, in, the problem we have is just the opposite. The annual brings much more interest than the international journal itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in Portuguese and in Spanish and in Italian and in French, we sell much more the annual than we sell the journal. So we have a business problem. We are facing a business problem because uh, by publishing the annual of psychoanalysis in those languages, we lose subscribers for the International Journal. So they, the people like the idea of a publication that concentrates what is the best published in the area. Not only, and I agree very much to what you said about not, uh, what is important not always to publish new ideas, but uh, uh, papers that allow people to share experiences, which is not easy, it's extremely complex this problem in terms of uh, writing, I think. May, may I also respond to what you say? I started out with that background statement, and I share with you many of your concerns when I think about the present situation. Mm -hmm. When I think about the, let's say, the beginning of, of, of the uh, 
psychoanalytic study of the child with its influence in going from drive to structure, from structure to ego. And then, as I see now less, but there was a period of five or ten years where everybody who wrote took on that new idea, quoted, quoted, quoted Anna Freud, quoted this. Today, nobody quotes Anna Freud, nor quotes anybody else. There was that period, maybe Labith Kuhn, where the public at large needs its 10 years to absorb new ideas and go on. This was so with this, and, and it was so, I think, with not only with the ego psychology, but later on, or today with a little bit with attachment, but not so much so. What concerns me today from a few point of publishing is something which I think you referred to. There is no specific organizing proposition around which the psychoanalytic frame of reference at either as a theory of, my, of, of the mind or as a treatment aspect or of an investigation. And they are different in, in, in scope. There's none there which seems to organize it the way it had been when people had a new idea and then for for many, many years stayed with this, let's say, developmental point of view. Mm -hmm. Many stayed with it and worked with it, quoted with it. This is all different. Today, there is an ecumenical spirit of trying to get together different ideas, and it doesn't come together. And we are unable, really, to bring a, 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 a organizing proposition at work, which bothers me greatly from a viewpoint of where are we from a viewpoint of publication. And it is very interesting for me to see, at least for the psychoanalytic study of the child, many of the papers who come today deal not with clinical psychoanalysis, deal, deal, do not treat with the treatment of specific age groups and so forth, mm -hmm. or with the developmental point of view. They go to the literature, they go to the movies, they go to, a, to, 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 to other fields, maybe a little bit now neuroscience, in, in which they seek to find a connectedness beyond their own internal thinking about what can they bring together. Uh, what should they do with funny and what should they do with the thing? What should they do with the various people? Uh, if, if each one has a little bit of a right, maybe if we put it together and, and, and dish it up together, we will get something which we all can believe in. But it doesn't work, seems to work. And we are in a very peculiar situation from a few bit of publication. In which way can we make a contribution here to somehow sort out the various explorations which are not based on basic psychoanalytic principle and see again to what degree we can bring it back and maybe find a few people uh, to bring it forward. I'd like to hear from, from, uh, from you, from Steve Levy, about this. I know the latest issue of JAPA was a little bit about theoretical pluralism in the psychoanalytic dictionary and what is common and what is, you know, common ground and what isn't. It's the basic, the basic premise of your, both your comments that I maybe would like to address. Um, while there is a lot of fretting about what both of you are saying, that there is a, not a single audience or a, a, uh, a commonality or common ground, it seems to me that it isn't the obligation of, of a journal uh, or of publishers to try to shape the field so much as reflect the field. Uh, and we live in a time in which psychoanalysis is, there are many psychoanalyses, uh, there are many directions of interest, there are many different kinds of practitioners. Um, psychoanalysis, which used to have a place, at least in this country, in the medical profession, no longer has such a central place. It's more amorphous. Uh, and in that regard, Journals reflect that and reflect the scholars in the field. You raise the issue of you know, what is the problem, and one way of looking at the problem is readership. But journals are not, at least in my mind, journals are not only aimed at readership. Um, journals are aimed at authors, and journals are a way of legitimizing uh, and 
securing the intellectual integrity of the field. And we, those functions are not all exactly the same. Um, and I think editors, when they decide about what they want in their journals, I think look in all of those directions um, in terms of publishing what's best and most interesting to those people who are best and most interesting at the moment, uh, which in our world is a much more diverse group than when I was a younger person. I um, que I'm sorry. Go ahead. I question whether diversity is the right term. These are noble sentiments, and I, I wish I could follow you. They are belied by the entire history of psychoanalysis with respect to which journal publishing has been political from the get-go. The YAR book for psychoanalytische and psychopathologische Forschungen was founded in 1909 to bring Bloiler and Jung on board. Bloiler, who was manifestly ambivalent about analysis, was co-director with Freud, Jung was the editor. A year later, the Zentralblatt for psychoanalyses is, it comes out of the Nuremberg Congress in 1909 as a sop to Steckel and Adler and all the Viennese who were so egregiously upset by the fact that Freud once Jung elected to a lifetime presidency of the IPA. At the next Congress, the Zeitschrift for psychoanalyses is founded because Steckel, over the past year, has resigned from the Vienna Society but refused to give back the journal. He has independent connections with the publisher. Freud circulizes all the contributors, uh, um, beseeching them not to contribute to the Central Blatt but to support a newly formed Zeitschrift for psychoanalyse. The whole history of psychoanalytic publishing is a history of factionalism. I'm not a passing judgment on it. It's not publishers' prerogative, perhaps, to shape the field, but publishers have to survive within the field. There are commercial considerations involved. And from where I sit, the fractionation of the field in my country is so complete at this point, in fact, that there is little possibility of implementing the vision you so ably articulate, Steve. I don't see it. I don't see it as diversity. I see it as competing paradigms in a Kuhnian sense characterized by languages that are increasingly incommensurate. You know, this is oh. Kuhn's argument. I mean, I mean, the sentiments articulated, for example, by Arnold Richards in, in, in your recent issue. Uh, uh, if we can just all have a dialogue together, if we can just be civil among ourselves, these principles will somehow emerge from the mix. You have to be talking a common language. Paradigms are incommensurable. That's, that's their key attribute. <clears throat> but, okay, I'm, I, 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 I have, I, I, know, I know your view very well. You know um, who went very well? Huh? I'm sorry, you know? I know your view very well. You know, we've, we've talked about it. But um, I have a couple of differences. One is that I don't think it's impossible for a journal to have a commitment to a particular perspective and yet to be respectful enough of other perspectives to grant them uh, equal rights. Contemporary psychoanalysis has been in publication since 63. Uh, and it began as a, as a journal that published papers from a number of points of view and it continues to. We publish contemporary Freudians, we publish Kleinians, we publish, now we are the, the uh, flagship of the intellectual flagship of the interpersonal point of view in psychoanalysis. And, and we publish interpersonal and relational papers more frequently than we publish papers that are, that are Freudian or Kleinian or Lacanian for that matter. But we do publish those papers and we, we actually are, are interested in them. Um, and we often have discussions that go with them that um, try to make links or not make links depending upon how the discussant wants to do it. Right. Well, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I'm not quite through. It, it seems to me, it seems to me that, uh, that in the past, psychoanalysis fiddled while Rome burned. We, we fought with each other in a way that was, that was disrespectful to one another and ultimately was nihilistic because we've ruined ourselves. We've ruined our field in that way. It, it, it's our fault in part, in large part. If 
if I do believe that it's possible to respect one another and maintain the differences. I don't think that common principles are going to emerge. I don't think that I don't think that we are dealing with a science here. That's not my. I, I think we're dealing with a hermeneutic, a system of hermeneutic interpretation. And her, systems of hermeneutic interpretation differ. There are many of them. There are many different ways of looking at the same thing. That that's not a problem. I don't think if we are respectful enough to see that we have many more commonalities and we have differences and unless we're friends with one another no one else is going to take up for us we have the whole field has to be of 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 one mind to preserve itself or we won't can i uh, uh, I, I would like to come back to the idea you presented that we are after all not there to provide leadership but rather to reflect the state of affairs now on the 150th anniversary at NYU, we are selected for publication at the Psychologic Study of the Child to revisit the treatment of little Hans. We are selected. It. The purpose was that if you see where it started and what the ideas were, how much was there implemented from a few point of the knowledge at this time, which was very little there from the first treatment of a child, we may be able to find ways to explore with those which, who are going to read that what had happened really from that extraordinary contribution which Freud made in the treatment of, little, of the phobia of a little Hans. Uh, the phobia disappeared. It was totally unorthodox. It was without play. It was without association. And, and there were only various interesting components, and there were factors in here so early in, in the treatment which teach us something if we look at it historically and see what happened to these processes over a period of time. What I say is I would not exclude from a few points of uh, my consideration as an editor to look for certain topics around which explorations of various peoples really make a contribution beyond what is usually in the field and go further to put uh, somehow uh, a, my own interest into the hopper. I would agree with you about that. And I, I would take issue with Paul's notion that I think we're conflating the problems that confront psychoanalysis today with pluralism. Our decline had little to do with the explosion of pluralism. Uh, in fact, it's my sense that pluralistic um, ways of thinking about inner life have been ways of holding on to our public, not chasing them away. We fight with each other about it. But it's not my sense that the rest of the world walks around scratching their heads saying, well, we should be less interested in psychoanalysis because there are many different perspectives within the field. I've never heard that from anyone. Um, I think, you know, we fret about the various perspectives and differences we have, and we fret at the same time about the difficulties we had in relation to your question. What are the difficulties we face as, as editors and publishers? But in doing so, Again, we become very, I think, solipsistic and don't pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the world, which has little to do with psychoanalysis. Our world has changed in major, major ways. Journals have trouble selling because young people use electronics. Um, there are people who go to Harvard and Yale who never set foot uh, in either library and who are, who are wonderful students. Um, the entire library is available on the internet. They don't buy books, and they don't read journals, and they do important, interesting, scholarly work, but in a different way. And we have not responded to that very well. And it becomes very easy to blame the sort of what you call the, 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 the sort of fractures in our field as explaining the troubles we're in. And I don't think that that's true. I think true. it's symptomatic, mm -hmm. the troubles you're in. Why don't you respond? Can I respond? I mean, there's so much, and I'm writing about this now, so I, I, I mean, all these comments are interesting and to be taken seriously. Let me say in response to Don, 
The spirit of receptive ecumenicalism among psychoanalytic journal editors is well nigh universal these days, and, and for good reason. And I'm all for civil respectful discourse among proponents of different theoretical perspectives. My point is simply that all this has been going on now for a quarter century, and it's not pointing towards any kind of higher level convergence. There will not, in my judgment, be a convergence of viewpoints. Now, Steve says, so what? Why is this consequential? Well, among the things you should worry about is the fact that you have reached the juncture where you will not have any dedicated psychoanalytic publishers in this country. None. We're all gone. The analytic press was the last holdout, and we've been <coughs> absorbed by our parent company. I no longer have a dedicated staff to work with. Um, Psychoanalysis' relationship to psychiatry and medicine in this country, which Steve and others have alluded to, is central to everything we're talking about in this country. Not in South America, I realize. Not in Europe to the same extent. Um, the problem I find as a publisher is that most psychoanalysts, not my distinguished colleagues here, <laughs> are frozen somewhere between 1955 and 1970 in terms of their mindset about the field and its relationship to mainstream psychiatry and medicine. And I, and I, and I say this from the standpoint of an empirical now analysis of psychoanalytic and psychodynamic books decade by decade. Look what happens after World War II. Fenichel's Psychoanalytic Theory of Neurosis, 1945. Hard to imagine any analyst or analytic candidate who wouldn't own that book. 1957, Brenner's Elementary Textbook of Psychoanalysis goes, yeah, it was published in 55, but if you let me finish, in 1957, Charles Brenner's Elementary Textbook of Psychoanalysis goes into its vintage mass market edition with sales off the charts. I, I, I've spent a lot of time on, on, on the phone with Random House. They can't give me, they can't give me uh, figures. Uh, what kind of book, and, and, and that's not to say that these, that these books represented, were immune to criticism, but they embodied something called psychoanalysis, and they had to be engaged and taken seriously by everyone who, who lay claim to the psychoanalytic mantle or even lay claim to being a serious student of psychoanalysis. Where is that book going to come from now? Someone tell me, what is that book? It's Pep. <laughs> Pep is not a book. No, it's not, but it is the compendium of all the English-speaking mm. psychoanalytic knowledge in one place, searchable in any way, shape, or form. You know, it's not, it's not easy, it's not an easy read, but it's all there, and it's well, a a to be sure, but a compendium is not tantamount to a distillation of principle that pertains to a cohesive field. Okay. Don't, you think we, don't you think we should separate our task tonight from the examination of the state of affairs of psychoanalysis from the problem of publication? No, they are interrelated, but I, don't, I think if you go over to the other side, uh, we are in a whole I, different way. I just want to pose a question, and then I'll, I'll shut up, and, and the field is all yours. Now, nah. Amid the declining sales <laughs> <Unlikely>. <laughs> of psychoanalytic journals in general, and I, I know this is an across-the-board phenomenon, I launched several months ago the International Journal of Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology which after one issue has more subscribers than most analytic journals, than let's say most second tier analytic journals. I do think the stature of JAPA and the international are unique in the field and are to be explained at least partially as an artifact of the era in which they were established. Okay? But I, I launched this journal, Psychoanalytic Self Psychology, which is skyrocketing, doing well beyond my expectations. Yeah, how many? Is that a good, is is that a good thing or a bad answers. thing? Is that a good thing or a bad thing for the field? How many, Paul? <laughs> We're approaching a thousand. Uh -huh. uh, it's nothing. In this day and age, it's nothing. Do you know what the typical psychoanalytic journal? Three years will you be selling? Probably more. Most, most of them are our membership, but a lot are non-membership subscriptions as well. I don't have the information. The point is well, once... Pardon me? The problem is these journals have gone skyrocketing no. in price. This journal 
People can't afford it. Not it works. The only way one can launch a new psychoanalytic journal at this point in time is through the sponsorship of an organization that provides a captive readership by providing it as a membership benefit to its members at a drastically reduced fee. You want to know what the fee is for members of the International Association of Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology? Pardon me? Which is independent. Let me just answer his question first. It's thirty-six dollars. That's what that's what the membership price is. Okay. And you get the journal for that thirty-six dollars. Yeah. That, that that's the cost to the society for each member subscription that society provides. Journals have become prohibitive for even libraries to buy. Absolutely. That's the economy but, is stupid, as Mr. Carville said. Understand that as the market contracts and subscribership plummets, we publish fewer and fewer, which means our unit cost rises, which means to break even, we have to charge more and more. This is just the economics of small I professional publishing. I used to, but I can't afford the individual volumes. It, it's true. Yeah. I, 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 I that's regrettable. I sympathize with you. I think Dr. Rochabaros yes, wants to Yes, I, I would like to comment. I'm, I, I want to, well, I would like to comment different uh, things, but uh, I want to go back first to the question of uh, securing the integrity of the field that you said. To what I agree, but I think that we have to be uh, very clear about that, because I, I was uh, just reading something that Jones wrote about the International Journal at the beginning of the century to the British Society and he said uh, that the aim of the journal was at the same time to create opportunity for interchange of ideas among different groups and to establish clear limits for what could be considered psychoanalysis. At that time this was addressed mainly to the Americans, to the distrust that he had about the American psychoanalysis, to the fear that he had that the Americans would dilute uh, psychoanalytical knowledge. Um, so, uh, uh, we have to be, I think, very careful about what we mean by securing the integrity of the field. As I said, I basically agree with that. I think that you, you said something quite important. That, the, that is, the journal is addressed also to authors and to the circulation of ideas. Um, but then I want to con connect to what you have said about uh, um, a, about creating a common language or a, a ecumenical psychoanalysis. I don't think that we, uh, we aim at creating either common grounds or uh, a common language. But I think that it is very important to create opportunities to develop a true controversies in psychoanalysis. I, I am, besides being the editor of the, uh, for Latin America, of the International Journal, also I, I, I work for a publisher in Brazil, uh, and I, I, I direct two, three collections of books. And again, the problems of publishing journals and books are quite different, I, I think. Uh, the public is quite, in some ways, is the same, but also is quite different. For example, the, uh, still, when we publish books in Brazil, if we manage to interest a, a big newspaper, a main newspaper, to discuss the book, then we, we, we are able to sell quite a lot of the books. Quite a lot means in Brazil sometimes uh, Rosenfeld's books can sell 40,000 copies Jeez, in a year. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, Betty yeah. Joseph can, can sell 20,000 mm -hmm. copies. Uh, we are talking about a culture which is much more open to psychoanalysis for many different reasons. Sometimes it's difficult to understand, but uh, it's quite different from the American mm -hmm. culture, I, I think. Uh, also because of the kind of uh, uh, um, patients we have in Brazil. 
uh, I think that uh, uh, we have in, in, in Brazil and in Latin America, but I would say in Brazil that I know uh, better. Uh, we have uh, politicians going to psychoanalysis, governors, presidents, uh, ministers. We have top models. We have football players. Uh, we have intellectuals. We have artists. We have quite a lot of doctors. Uh, even quite a lot of uh, um, psychiatrists, neuroscientists. So it's much more open. Can I ask what the connection is to the universities there or to the medical training? It's a very complex question, this one, the connections to the university in Brazil, because uh, I would say that known and quite a lot in some, time, in, in, in some ways, because uh, up to 10 years ago, all the chairs of psych uh, psychiatry were dominated by psychoanalysts, who were also psychiatrists. Nowadays, uh, they, uh, they are uh, occupied by psychiatrists and uh, in, oh, publicly against psychoanalysis. Personally, not so much, which is a particularity of the Brazilian culture as well. So the, uh, the professor of psychiatry from Sao Paulo University <coughs> publicly will criticize psychoanalysis, but he is in analysis, his wife and his uh, daughter <laughs> is in analysis. And, uh, 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 but uh, um, I think that because of the demands of academic life, psychoanalysts uh, drop out of, of university in Brazil. Now they are coming back, and they are coming back through the journals and through the psychoanalytical publications, because was they coming uh, back to the university? To the university, because uh, in terms of careers... To, through which departments? Uh, to psychiatry, to departments of psychoanalysis, to departments of anthropology, um, and uh, even to, for example, the chair of gynecology at Sao Paulo University. Sorry? Uh, gynecology uh -huh, yeah. has a department of uh, uh, psychotherapy. So they, they also so they, See, they I, occupy uh, places in different departments. What is the relationship of popularity in various disciplines or by the public at large with the central issue of what are we talking about and standing for as analysts today in connection with publication? The, sometimes the, the popularity is misleading True. And disappears Absolutely after true. 10 years yes. and goes uh -huh. into directions which has, leaves no echoes from a few point of, of things. And, so, and sometimes a very quiet approach can have very powerful influences. Therefore, when you say something which true. I love to hear, that uh, it is, it, it, there is really a great deal of interest, it still does not help me sufficiently to say, where am I from a few point of the assessment of what is needed and wanted by the public, which really would lead in the direction around which one can seek together, maybe, answers which are coming to ecumenical mishmashes. And therefore, I still say the, raise the question, how can I, having a responsibility with diminishing readers, but this doesn't bother me that much, the diminishing of readers. What bothers me is its place within the general const uh, frame of reference of our inquiries. Do we have a place here around which it speaks? When I put it that way, I say I have to be more than a reflective organ from a viewpoint of what goes on today in our psychoanalytic international or national community. I have to bring about something around which the interest of the people is stimulated and their curiosity and their, their, their applicability to their, maybe to their, to their daily life. I see uh, not so much, and I'm so pleased that you see so much more. I see the, how people struggle when they present their case to seek that kind of a 
present uh, preference in interpretation, which may suit a particular case. It does not come with conviction because tomorrow it will be changed. They seek, they look for it. It doesn't seem to be from the viewpoint of the reader or from the viewpoint of the writer an internally absorbed and integrated view around which I can find today some sort of a voice around which, which will guide me what to do next. And therefore, the question I raise is not to say, look, it's too bad, people don't know what they are doing. I have to raise the question, why is it that way? Why are we in this situation? What has happened here that the various propositions which in the past had an influence have suddenly run out to be a guide to people's correctly or incorrectly trying it on? And there is that kind of... of, uh, of uh, attempt of finding answers by trying on not only one idea, but many ideas. And many of the papers which we get, very often in their summary and discussion, give the history of many ideas, how it may be applicable. And then I say, at least could we feel we should agree what basic elements of psychoanalysis is, so when people go off, have a good time, have a good voyage, but how far can you go? And staying mm -hmm. within the frame of reference, not of our interesting ideas and ecumenical spirit, but the opposite of a re-identification of a basic platform. I'm a little afraid we are going to get far away from the issue of publication, but it's hard for me not to respond to what you just said. Uh, in the first place, I don't think it is true that people don't know what they're doing. Um, that's a lament that we regularly have. That usually means people are doing it somewhat differently from what we're doing. I have never had any difficulty in knowing when I'm talking to a psychoanalyst, whether they speak French or German or Italian or they're relationalists or they're self-psychologists or they're ego-psychologists. The, the fact is that our field is much broader than it used to be. And we no longer have the idea that we have to corner facts. Um, analysts of all persuasions are interested in sexuality, they're interested in gender, they're interested in, in personal meaning. There are many different kinds of therapies and many blending of therapies. The world's a very different place. People don't think in 10-year blocks of time like they used to. Um, people don't take jobs for life. The world is very different and the fact that we're very different doesn't distress me the way it, it sounds like it sometimes does in this conversation. We publish for a broader array of audiences than we ever used to. But if you look at the various journals um, that are supposedly vastly different, the subject matter is the same in almost all of them. Uh, the language is slightly different and the emphases are slightly different. Um, but the subject matter remains the same. Um, humans, why do humans behave the way they do? What is the human relationship to the rest of the world? Psychopathology. Um, subject matter of all the journals is to me the same. Uh, and the sort of search for the good old days and that central idea that holds us together, um, I think reflects a, a lack of adaptation to the way things are now. In some ways it may be, to say something radical, Paul, maybe it's a good thing that there are no more psychoanalytic publishers. That psychoanalytic books should be published by publishers, not by psychoanalytic publishers. And they won't be published at all. That's a worry. I'm not so sure it's true. I uh, well take it to the bank. Oh, yes, Dr. Brenner. How are you? Steve. Always behind me. It's always behind me. <laughs> <laughs>
Steve is the editor of the journal that is supported by an organization. And it's, it's his responsibility, correctly, to reflect the various uh, and respond to the various differences of opinion about how the mind works and how people stay well or get sick, which is what he just said. Now, the psychoanalytic study of the child, I mean, what you said is something different. You want there to be consensus about certain aspects of your theories and mine too, about how the mind works and develops, that not everybody shares. You can't expect that we'll all get to because they don't care. Look, we hear that uh, psychoanalysis isn't uh, part of the actual science. It's just an explanatory uh, um, exercise. Yeah? Right? It's a very different idea. Right from the start. And Little Hans was written, as I see it, by Freud, not to say anything about treatment, but to support his conclusion that, in fact, little children, age five, let's say, can have conflict over sexual and And that, that that's when he wrote the article of health. Now, I agree with you as far as making it, using it for didactic purposes at the present time, but I think you have to realize but that's what you're doing, and that's very different from the task that edit, most editors of psychoanalytic at the present time see as their responsibility and their efforts. You read me correctly. <laughs> may, I, uh, may I add something to this? Um, the, well, first, it occurs to me that, that um, that uh, there's a situation of strange bedfellows here. It may be that both Catholicism and psychoanalysis have to look to Latin America for their future. Uh, <laughs> um, so it certainly seems that, that your, your uh, experience is very different in a very good way than ours. Uh, I'm happy to hear it. I didn't know this, actually. I knew that Latin America, and I did know that in Latin America there was much more it was much more popular than it was here. But the, the figures that you're citing are interesting. 40,000 copies of, of a book by Rosenfeld. That's stunning. That's remarkable. Just remarkable. What I wanted to bring up, though, was something uh, that I think is not something that psychoanalytic editors do. It's something that some of us talk about doing. We haven't thought of a way of doing it. And that is um, writing for a broader public. We. Our, our culture has changed, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to address it uh, by, by writing to, the, to a, a broader array of people, but it's one of the only ways we've got. And psychoanalytic editors may or may not be in a position to, to help with that, but I don't think that the kind of conversation we're having and the way that we're portraying psychoanalysis here tonight is something that the public understands at all. I don't think that there's any appreciation in the wider public that we're reasonable and that we've grown and that we're not the way we were in 55 to 70, no matter what you say, Paul. That we're, that we're not and, and that we are... Um, I that never we're, suggested you five were. I know, I know. <laughs> but that the field really is much more uh, ready to look outside itself, to be influenced by, by other fields. To, the, the, the ideas are much more cutting edge than the, than the public knows. And um, I, I don't know whether informing the public that this is the case would change things, but it's something we should think about. Would we you, think about more than we do. Would you differentiate what I mentioned before, that when we speak, say the public and psychoanalysis, do we mean the public and the theory of the mind of psychoanalysis? Do we mean clinical psychoanalysis from a viewpoint of the treatment of people? Do we mean psychoanalysis as a method of investigation? 
can we really speak about psychoanalysis and the public without really taking some time in order to see which aspect of it is meaningful to which part of the population? I, I, don't, even, the listen, I don't even know how to do this, but what I would say is that all the, the things that you mention are things that, of course, we should... Yeah. Why not all of them? Well, but, but our, the question I raise is, psychoanalysis may have a specific interest to philosophy from a viewpoint of the understanding of the conditions of the mind with all its problems of ethics, of morality, of truth, and of all so forth, but not so much with its treatment method. Hmm? Therefore, what I get from that discipline may be one aspect of our contribution, which is not unimportant, but it is very selective. Hmm? It, nor would it be the method of investigation, particularly today under, under question. So what I say is all of it is interrelated, but I think what we present to the public, which aspect we present to the public, will also help us to understand the specific reaction to what we are wanting to say and to whom we are wanting to say it, or who will take it on. And, and be able to uh, explore it further. And there's a good deal of difference. I think over, over decades, we have somehow speak about psychoanalysis as a unit in this. But it, historically, it went in different direction. Once we made progress here, at other time we, we, we made progress in another area. The public was with us in, in the field of everyday um, uh, uh, psychoanalytic conflicts, but it wasn't with <coughs> us about paranoia. You know, it, 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 it is not so simple when we really speak about our, our, our role here. Which one, how many papers in which area should we select for publication? You know, Dr. Neubauer, I, I, I respect everything you're saying. My reaction, though, is on a much more prosaic level. When we're talking about the public, as far as I'm concerned, all that matters is finding a way to grab them. I don't care what it is that we have to say, as long as it represents some aspect of our field. But, I it's, but it's, a very it's a tough sell. It's a very tough sell. Can it's I also a worthwhile question whether psychoanalytic journals are designed, first of all, I don't know, exactly know who the public is, but I think I yeah, okay. have the sense that you mean our culture I mean, as I mean the large. educated lay public. I mean, everybody I don't, who's not a psychoanalyst. I don't think of JAPA, for example, as a journal to that group. No, and I don't think contemporary psychoanalysis is either. Really what I'm bringing up is the possibility that the field and us as leaders of, of intellectual content in the field perhaps need to think more about this than we do. And, and it reminds me what Anna Freud said about her treatment method. She says, you know what, I offer a smorgasbord. I will see what the child takes on from what I offer, and this will guide me. Mm -hmm. What you say is, I present and I will see what the public is going to do with it. Yes? Yes. Can I, oh, yeah. yeah, I have so many reactions, but before I say anything, I would like to apologize to Dr. Brenner for cutting him off when he correctly reminded me that elementary textbook was published in 1955. My eyes have grown weary, Dr. Brenner. I didn't recognize you. I just wanted to apologize. <laughs> Not as I hear it, no. Oh, really? Psychoanalytic. Uh, you asked me why I hadn't commented on psychoanalytic quarterly. Uh, I don't claim to have uh, across the board expertise. Uh, I view Psychoanalytic Quarterly again as a creature of the time of its creation. For a journal that was founded in 1932 and has garnered more institutional subscribers than all the journals I've ever launched together, uh, to have 3,000 subscribers alongside a startup self psychology <laughs> journal that after a couple months has 1,000. It still gives one moment to pause, okay? Over a hundred dollars. Pardon me? The is over a hundred dollars. Moment to pause about what I view in more extreme. Uh, I think the the fact that what was viewed as a non-analytic renegade viewpoint roundly rejected by the psychoanalytic establishment as recently as 25 years ago should inside of a couple of months have a journal subscribership 
one third of that of so distinguished and long standing a journal as the quarterly gives one moment to pause about the impact of fractionation on the field and whether there is a core to be resuscitated. Okay. Let me address the core or explain the core very well. Okay. Everybody who calls himself a psychoanalyst is interested in how the mind functions, what, what it is and how it happens that some people are mentally ill in one way or another, and also how the mind functions uh, in, uh, you know, when it's so-called normal, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how it develops. That much, that much, pretty much everybody who calls himself or herself a psychoanalyst Reason. As would That's a gestalt the therapist and a neuropsychologist. Like they <laughs> that, that much they agree on. But what they say about it, about how the mind develops and how it functions in health and health, is what is very different from one to one. Did you have a question? I had a, just wanted to pursue a, a topic here about psychoanalysis sort of in the larger, in the face of the larger public. Because I think among ourselves, various schools, I mean, Jungian analysts, you know, we can debate and talk about how, what our vision of psyche is and what our vision of death processes are. Um, but if you watch Oprah Winfrey, when she's not interviewing um, celebrities, <coughs> two days a week, and when she's not giving away merchandise another day a week, the other times she's, she's dealing with psychological issues. And the people that are there that are commenting and, and speaking in very authoritative ways, are all, they're not analysts, they're not psychoanalysts, hardly ever. I've never seen anybody that was identified as a psychoanalyst. And they're very often commenting on death processes incorrectly. Right. And it drives me crazy. And I'm you frankly pardon? You can be correct. I can be correct. But not everybody who calls no. himself a psychoanalyst agrees if you call it. But I could take a comment that I recently heard on Oprah and every psychoanalyst in this room would be like, oh no, that's terrible. You know, and and it's going out to the general population. And it just seems to me that there's some way in which, as psychoanalysts, we haven't gotten, there's a, some kind of connection out into the world. And perhaps publication is a, is a way of bridging that gap, that there's, a, that there's a real gap between the level of our conversation among ourselves and our impact in the world at large. And that's a real problem, I think, with publication and media and the internet. Really, you know, those are mediums that really could address that issue. What was the comment, Catherine, that the uh, well, I hate to tell you about it. it was, there, were three, there were three people who had very serious psychological problems. One was an anorexic. One was a very, very fat woman. And <clears> one was a woman who had very serious marital issues. <throat> And there was a psychologist on there who, at the end of these three poor women exposing very intimate, you know, personal material, that the psychologist who was coming on said, well, the problem here is they all hate themselves. <laughs> Self-hatred is the problem. <laughs> Catherine, in a way, this might not be the other way around, but that it's that because of the it's because of the prior, prior success of psychoanalysis in permitting a certain kind of vocabulary to enter the larger public that we can now have the Opera Winfrey show and the hundreds of other shows like that. Given which, it then becomes an unrealistic expectation, whatever the channels of publication, it becomes an unrealistic expectation we have, at that level, in that audience, a kind of expert competence that you might pay $300, $400 an hour for, right? You're just not going to, at that level, you're not, you're not going to get it. So the success, it's, 
seems to me, I mean, this is to me a theme of all of the meetings that I've attended, this extraordinary inability of us to, to accept or to recognize that psychoanalysis is a victim of its own success. That it has irredeemably, irre irredeemably entered a larger culture. And, and once it has entered that larger culture, we no longer have control over the vocabulary, how that vocabulary is used. But there continues to be specialized training and the dissemination of specialized training. And journals play, <coughs> have traditionally been one of the main mechanisms for that. I'd like to respond to that because I very much agree with that. Um, the, the fact, we have been very successful in allowing depth psychological thoughtfulness to become a commonplace in our culture. Whether it's exactly right, um, my sense is that really wrong ideas in the general culture self-correct. The role of a journal, I think, in relation to the, the comment you took me up on uh, around the integrity of the field is that much as you say, it is a, in the journal world, it is a place for highly sophisticated and well-trained people to discuss in a depth way the ideas that are relevant to the field and to the culture. One is surely on television going to hear another version of those. What I meant by the integrity of the field is not a matter, doesn't mean what's right, or protecting a particular school of thought but of having a place in which really knowledgeable people can discuss ideas in an intellectual framework in which they can question each other, in which what they say needs to be written in a careful way that is reviewed by peers before it appears in public, to which people can respond, so that there is another level of that same discourse that we hear on television, that we hear at cocktail parties, which is in some ways a reflection of our success, not our failures. To me, it would be very frightening if I went to a cocktail party of non-analysts and they all started sounding like me. I'd go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, may, I, may I ask you in this connection? If you look at the history of psychoanalysis, there are fashions which go far beyond what you just said. Namely, there are preferences of explanatory statement out of the internal setup of supervision or whatever it may be around with people for a period of time take what is preferred today as an explanatory statement and continuously redo it and redo it and give it. Whether it was uh, uh, the Melanie Klein, whether it was uh, the uh, attachment theory today, or whether it is something, people stick to it, repeat it and repeat it without ever, for instance, trying on a different explanatory statement which I then should publish. For instance, they would say, I stand for the, for the psychoanalytic theory of development, there's transformation throughout life. But in my case presentation, I give you the first two or three years of life. There it is. There is the source, there is the problem, that's where we have to get to, that's where we have to present it. Transformation into the, into the latency period, into pre-adolescence, into adolescence. After all, the changes which occur anyhow, whoever the child is at the age of two, is not part of the presentation of cases. Look at the cases which you read, and you will see they all miss that dimension of transformation over a period of development. They are, they are taking on, and we have been doing this, uh, you know, in, in our field, uh, preferred explanatory statement about uh, the, the genetic component of uh, which they get stuck. And they give it to us. And the literature review in every paper is fabulous, <coughs> how they quote this uh, continuously. And therefore, I say, we have in our field, like in other fields, preferred way of looking at nature, uh, looking at our patient, and using it in a way. It is not wide open. It is not that we present an open image. We present our own zeitgeist in our own psychoanalytic field of pre preference. And therefore, to come back to our topic, what are we as publisher 
going to do? Is that the way you want it? Is that the way I give it to you? After all, you make the choice. Is that the publication? Is that what we have in mind when we say we sit together and say I have 20 papers here, which one should I publish? Or do I say in which way would I do what I think psychoanalysis stands for about the developmental transformations through life? <coughs> that I need something there which takes consideration of that. It is as an analyst publishing this. I need to not uh, to be silent about its absences over a long period of time. Um, I, may I go a step back? I wanted to respond to you, Steve, uh, just because I, I had a feeling that you might have thought earlier that I was proposing that journals should themselves be aimed at the public, which I, I certainly was not. Um, I wouldn't want to do that any more than you, and for all the same reasons. What I really wanted to say, and I actually, I thought this, your comment, was, sir, was, was uh, really interesting. I'm not sure that I've thought about it that way before, but it seems right on the nose to me um, that, that we have, uh, that psychoanalysis has, has, is a victim of its own success um, in that way. But there's no reason why we can't try to feed back on the, on the public image that has, has resulted from our success. I just don't think we should do it through journals. If we should do it at all, and it's an if, it's as, it's as intellectual leaders in our field, should we be encouraging people to be thinking about how they might communicate with a wider public? I think we should. We could, for example, have, have um, this, I just, it just occurs to me off the top of my head, but we could, for example, have a, a group uh, run by people who are editors um, who uh, the, the purpose of the group being to think about, to cogitate, to, to, to what's the think tank phrase, I forget, but uh, to come up with ideas for how these things could be conveyed. I don't know that there are any magic bullets here, but that's the sort of thing I have in mind, something quite separate, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe relating to our role as intellectual leaders in the field, but, but not um, in, in changing the nature of our journals at all. Can we, will we, and why not find the young Peter Neubauers, the young Charlie Brenners, the young Heinz Hartmanns, the young Anna Freuds? Uh, I don't see them. And uh, is that a cultural reason? I mean, it is partly what? my point. I mean, because but these we men, lived in the golden age. That's, that's and we used to come here every Tuesday, and Margaret Mahler, and Heinz Hartmann, and Charlie Brenner. Jacob Barlow and Peter Neubauer and Max Scher and Edith Jacobson, I can go on and on and on. And now, I would have to say, we don't find that quality of analyst from my, from my point of view. And I don't know if there's a way to solve that problem. Distinguished analysts of their generation emerged against a backdrop of cohesiveness and coherence and mainstream saliency that simply doesn't true. exist it's anymore. Not true. Just not true. I mean, let me... You two have known our disagreements. Yeah, 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 I know you disagree with me. I, I do not take exception to attempts to, to posit a common ground among analysts in the manner that Dr. Brenner does. I don't take exception to that at all. Uh, but the commercial economic reality is the field has fractionated, and there are all these little groups with their own takes on the theory and the technique and the therapy. And they're tiny little clusters, and they don't interact very much at all in terms of their book buying preferences and their reading habits. That's the reality. Now, if, 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 there, if there are ways at the interpersonal level in group settings such as this, to bring them all together, then I'm all for it. Is that Do you have a question? Like analysis? Uh, in terms of my work in the history of medicine, pretty much so. I don't think there's an idea of progress in, psychoanalog in psychoanalysis analogous to the idea of progress in medicine or science, but that's my, my perspective. Go ahead. See, I, 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 sorry, um, one of the things that you haven't mentioned, uh, I'm not familiar with most people here on the uh, analysis, but it isn't uh, in practice 
isn't it something that you do? And wouldn't the people that make things interesting are the people that are really doing interesting things? And from my experience, if you have 3,000 people that are really doing something, you can change the rule. It doesn't matter because it's the interaction. It's what's, is, is it happening or is it not happening? Is it real? Is it interesting? Can I pick up on that? You touched on something that I wanted to address both to Mr. Stern and the editor of the Analytic Press, publisher of the Analytic Press. Because right, I make a suggestion, uh, a suggestion as a comment. Uh, the suggestion is that you might, a group of people, a group of people here, might actually get together and consider we have a new editor for a new journal, I wish I wish they would call the best, with great success. Um, you might consider an exhibition on psychoanalytic journals. And I'll tell you why. Here's my comment. In the 1950s, Tristan Zala, the Romanian French database, gave a series of 15 lectures on French radio, each one of which, one hour long, quite substantial, one hour long, was devoted to one of the major avant-garde journals of the interwar years. Three decades later, in 1979, one of the most famous exhibitions at the Hayward Gallery in London was an exhibition called Dada and Surrealism Review, where they took the French word for journal, Revue, Revue d'art, Revue des sciences humaines, etc. And shortly after that, a gentleman called Jean-Michel Blas erected a whole successful independent publishing empire in Paris, the basis of which was publishing, republishing, accurate facsimiles of all of those journals, starting with the, the very ones that Tristan Zaha had identified as important. My point is this, when Zaha identified these journals as important, he wasn't saying, oh, by the way, for those of you who have uh, the dirty fingers of collector's instinct, here are the ones that matter. No, what Zaha and Breton and all the others were really talking about was the function that the journals played within their communities. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that when you talk about the splits mm -hmm. uh, between the various journals in Vienna, Steckel, Jung, and so on, this is exactly the dynamic that was happening um, within the avant-garde community, where the sales were smaller. None of these people expected to make money from their sales. And by the way, there was often private money that was supporting the publications of these journals. And so it was rather... If you could direct me to some of that I need. This is what I think is not being addressed. The psychological recovery is not being turned upon itself. Mm -hmm. The language of splitting here that would be absolutely relevant. The, the language of audience is not the language just of a culture. But what is the function? These people are asking themselves, what is it that they hope to achieve? And I'd like to add then one very brief comment to make the point because there's my favorite journal was the Nouvelle Revue de Psychanalyse, edited by Jean-Bertrand Jean Pontalis, who was deeply, deeply influenced by, by the Surrealists. And he decided with his colleagues that issue 50, now why issue 50, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I haven't read it because I refuse to open it. It's my favorite issue. I refuse to open it. <laughs> issue 50 would be the final issue of NRP, the Nouvelle Revue de Psychanalyse. And why? He said because it had achieved its purpose. And it, did not, it would not continue to exist merely to be a record of whatever was available in the field. In other words, he actually applied to this wonderful journal a kind of avant-garde insight. We have a purpose. And so it seems to me the first thing that we have to decide is what is the object of the journal? Is the object of the journal, this is, this is part of the discussion which I have had, to record what is in the field, that is the laudable, well-established academic purpose? Or is the object of the journal to bring about a certain kind of knowledge, a certain kind of experience, in which case the size of it doesn't matter. But what, the, what that does mean, however, like Pontalis, um, like the Avantgarde, we have to be prepared to fold. We have to be prepared 
not to succeed in the commercial sense, yes, but you have to accept the bet. You have to take. You have to take the. the well, I have to make a living. I mean, it's an it's an atomistic perspective on the inherent intellectual value of any small scholarly journal. And you know, these days there are many, many such journals because they're self-published because of the revolution in in the technology that really enables but any the society. revolution in technology is only enabling people to do today what once in the twenties and thirties was basically done by private patronage. To be sure, that's no argument yeah. here. Uh, your formulation makes me think of the task of an analyst to publish. How does he apply his analytic understanding, not only for what he selects for publication, but what the purpose of the publication is? Exactly. How does an analyst think about that? Mm -hmm. What would he really want to do in order to understand its role, its impact, and its relationship to the public at large, to the resistances in the community, or to the absences of our contact with group psychology or with neuroscience, where Avia is an analyst thinking about our task to publish. And in a way, we have to say, we have an, a number of additional responsibilities here. We want us not to publish in order to say, here is something, do what you want. I think we have to bring to it a certain frame of reference around which we can organize our, our contribution. And it's very interesting to be our discussion tonight because I can see that uh, from a viewpoint of our basic assumption what we are, should be, we are different. Hmm? We are different from a viewpoint of aim and we are different from a viewpoint of its uh, impact. Uh, we are here, there is some impact and at the same time we, are, we, are, we cannot really share its, uh, its, its possibilities. And therefore, your formulation is some which I think uh, deserves a good deal of, of attention from our part in order to uh, speak as analysts about the topic. Mm -hmm. We have time for a few more questions from the audience, but I want to add one of my questions, which is a topic that hasn't come up much is the issue of research, how we define it, how we solicit it, um, is it relevant? Um, I know JAP has a new section sort of devoted to that. I just wanted to hear a little bit about that topic. So the flip side of appealing to the public There's is also doing... also a question behind you. Oh. Go, I'm feeling your question. Uh, I'm feeling with Dario. Dario's question. Yeah. Yeah. First. Go ahead, and then, and then and I'll come back to my question. Anyone has anything to say? Re research is a, you know, it's a complex question. You're, you're right, we, at JAPA, we, we, there is a new section on empirical research. Um, it's published regularly. Uh, it's an, you know, most people have told me it's a waste of time um, that analysts sort of bemoan their failure to do empirical research and to test their ideas in adjacent fields and nobody, nobody will be interested in it and no one will read it. Um, the fact is analysts historically have published, those that have done empirical research have mainly published their research in non-analytic journals. Um, there are complex reasons for that, uh, historically. Um, but what it has accomplished is to create the continual illusion that there is little research going on and that most analysts wouldn't be interested in hearing about it anyway. Um, and so we at the journal, this wasn't uh, just my idea, um, have decided to publish, to, to make research, and here, in some ways, I'm undoing what I said earlier. Uh, in order to at least try to create a culture within our own profession that whenever one picks up a journal, there, there is going to be empirical research uh, that, would, that would be understandable by analysts. Uh, one of the things that we insist upon is that on the one hand, we don't use terms that the average expectable analyst will not be able to understand. Uh, and yet at the same time, quality empirical researchers will not find fault either with the exposition of the methodology, the results, and the interpretation. So we're trying to speak to two worlds in order to try to create on a regular basis the idea that analysts, there are questions that can be answered with 
with quantitative and qualitative kinds of research methodologies, not all analytic questions, uh, that it is a regular part of the way analysts ought to think, uh, that analysts ought to, public who do research ought to speak to other analysts rather than just other researchers. What the long-term results of this will be, whether it will in some ways change the culture or not, I've been struck by the volume of submissions that we've gotten, many of which have been of very high quality, but with some skepticism on the part of the researchers because they're concerned about whether the average expectable analyst will really be interested. It causes all sorts of difficulties, as, as I, I expect all of you know. We, we, we've, analytic journals work at analytic speed, and empirical researchers like to have their data out fast, uh, not 18 months or two years later. Um, you have to publish the data so that a, a reader can read about an experiment and conduct that same experiment to see whether it works in their hands, which means detailed methodologic exposition of the ideas which is different from the usual way analysts write and analytic readers are used to reading. Um, it is an experiment. Um, we publish also abstracts of the posters so that young researchers who want to get a publication out of preliminary data can publish in a major journal. Um, it's a sort of a work in progress uh, that I intend to continue as long as I'm doing the job that I'm doing. I get very little feedback about it other than the number of submissions has steadily increased and from better and better research scholars. Uh, it's an amazing burden on the editorial board because you have to have a whole separate editorial board that can understand that work and comment on it well. Uh, I try to make sure that there's one non-researcher that reviews every research article and that person has to understand what the, the research is about. Whether we'll interpenetrate with the empirical research community and the academic research community or not, I don't know. Uh, it hasn't been going on long enough, at least at our journal, for me to know. Um, one of the points is that it's regular. It's not occasional. Uh, so that someone who picks up the journal is going to know that in every other issue there'll be a research section. Uh, they can count on it. Whether it will make a difference or not, I don't know. Uh, there's much more psychoanalytic research going on than people know about much more going on. Uh, it's, in some ways, it's like avant-garde music. We don't want avant-garde, we don't want researchers to only do research for other researchers and to no, no one else to know about it. And that's been the history. Um, that's really been the history. Um, whether it will be useful or not, I don't know. I don't have any sense at the moment. I, a question in relation to that uh, has to do with feedback. My experience after three or four years of, of editing a journal is that I get precious little feedback. Um, you know, my friends tell me it's wonderful, and no one else says anything. <laughs> do any of you ever do surveys on what percentage of articles are read? No. Uh, in, in, no, I, I'm, I'm not being facetious. That I, uh, the worst I fate of an idea is not to be rejected, but to be ignored. And I wonder... Oh, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. I, w I would like to comment on that. Um, before being the editor of the International Journal, I was the editor of the Brazilian Journal of Psychoanalysis. And we had an extraordinary experience related to that because we did a survey. Uh, the, the, the journal is published by uh, the Brazilian Association of uh, uh, Psychoanalysis, uh, a kind of federation of all the Brazilian societies. And we got to the conclusion that 95% per, of the uh, subscribers did not read the journal, did not, uh, and 50% did not even open uh -huh. the envelope <laughs> containing the journal, and they would throw away uh, the uh, we did that also uh, with the International Journal in Latin America and uh, with the, the Libro Noir. The Libro Noir is, uh, uh, as I, I was saying, is a um, compilation of the best articles, uh, be best papers published in the International Journal. Uh, and then we did a, a survey, one of the, our societies did a survey and got to a very peculiar conclusion. 
the International Journal was read by about 20% of the subscribers uh, at most in some parts of Brazil and some parts of Latin America, not even by 10%. But the Libro Anual was read by 80% of the people. I'm sorry, what was it? 80%. No, what was, what read was read by 80%? The Libro Anual, the Anual oh, uh -huh. yeah, yes, of yes. Psychoanalysis. Why is that? Uh, there are two reasons uh, for that. One is because the institutes um, um, they, they, because the, 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 the Libro is published in local languages, in Portuguese and Spanish, so the institutes, they use the, the, the international, the, the Libro as part of the seminars. So, uh, as they, they were able to interest candidates in reading the annual, uh, this increased enormously the readership because then also the analysts, the senior analysts have to read, to read also in order to be able to follow discussions about papers and so on. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, the, uh, the annual was much more read than the international journal. Uh, the other reason is related to the fact that they felt that the annual of psychoanalysis was, uh, that, that there was a group of people doing the work that they, uh, for them. Who, uh, as uh, there is a committee, is a, is a group of people who select the papers who are going to be published. So, so they felt that uh, the annual would publish the best of the best of the papers. So they would save time reading the annual and not the international journal. So this is a, a problem that was created by us also because of uh, our success in publishing. We are being, becoming victims of that as well because this is happening in France as well and I, I think it's happening in Italy as well with the, the, the version in Italian. But you know, articles Quality articles don't often, aren't necessarily read when they first appear in a journal that you receive. Um, often, true. often a paper that that grows in interest, people begin to hear about an author or a paper uh, that they will then refer back to. I wouldn't expect that most people would get a journal in the mail, and most people who get one usually get four or five. Would sit down and read all of them. Um, it would be very unlikely that that would occur. Many people would want to have them. Um, nowadays, of course, they'll want to have them electronically, which makes the sale of hard copies much more difficult. But papers also often develop a cult about them, and people go back and read them, and that that's okay. I think journals develop a cult about them, too. And my sure. point is cautionary that, that subscribership numbers, which, again, from where I sit, are nothing to write home about, are not directly correlative with the influence and impact of a journal. Sometimes you just subscribe because you've been subscribing and you like getting it. You and it makes it, you feel good to get that journal. You see, it raises the question to you. You started out to say, in a way I feel most comfortable if I reflect the activities of the ideas which are there on the marketplace of psychoanalysis and it is my job to show that. If this is so, why should you get a feedback? Secondly, if this is so, why would a journal where you select a group of people, what they consider to be significant for the reader, why should that be successful? Huh? And when you do that, don't you step out from that neutral role <laughs> which you presented? Well, it isn't a purely neutral role. I th there's a tension that I, that I think editors feel between reflection, attempting to influence, putting new ideas out there, which are th the biggest worry I always have as an editor is, am I going to miss the next good idea that passes my desk? Is there going to be some paper that comes by that that'll turn out to be an important and influential new contribution 
And I won't recognize it as such because it'll be poorly written or I won't completely understand it or it'll be different enough that it doesn't reflect. And how do I pick those out of the papers that come through that I don't think make much of a contribution that are, that are new but not really important? It's very hard to know that. And purely being reflective of what's out there is obviously impossible because mm. um, there's a sort of a, a tension around that. What I meant to say about reflecting was merely that we live in a pluralistic analytic world, therefore we're going to publish papers from many different perspectives. That to me is not problematic. And the, the age in which journal, new journals often mm -hmm. are come on the market to, to, to deal with a political issue, as Paul points out. Mm -hmm. But the ones that last, I think over a long period of time, lose that. Uh, and lose the, the sort of connection to the founding idea and maybe the political idea where they start. Let me, can I briefly sure. just re reply because there's a downside. Yes, everyone is ecumenical. We live in a time of theoretical pluralism. Everybody is receptive to papers of quality and originality from varying points of view. The downside is that when there's a field that, that, that is fractionated to the point that there are so many journals, numerically speaking, That's a problem. one doesn't have any self-assurance that by reading your journal or any one journal, one is getting the best of the best, the creme de la creme. And that's, that simply has to do with the number of journals. Yes, you're on the lookout for original ideas by important new people arriving on the scene, but many of them aren't going to submit to you in the first place. So if I, as a reader, have limited time, limited resources, limited budget, and I want to read a journal that's going to give me everything I need to know about psychoanalysis, maybe I'll pick yours, but I'm just saying it ain't like it was. One last it question like for Francis. Was. Thomas Kuhn before, yeah. the structure of scientific thought, which is which, which people I often think structure forget scientific it. revolution. Structure scientific revolution that people forget it, it itself is a polemic and not, not, not a fact. And that the, that the very the very the, the very vision it proposes of, of, of infinite uh, subjectivity actually is not what's infusing a little bit of discussion. Peter Nobar was talking about some basics and doing that getting back to the, the, the the, the fact that that, that journal has, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I'm an imbiber of knowledge, yep. and that that, journal, that oftentimes journal editors are afraid of making statements about certain uh, facts, of moral facts, not moral facts, but truths, and that taking positions. If you take if you take if you take the division of of a kind of infinite set of paradigms that are from which uh, uh, you know editors cannot have any kind of share shared language, mm -hmm. then then in a certain way you're defeating the fact that you, this is not a commercial enterprise ultimately. Uh, it it right. isn't. And and you know it's not I'm not making a claim. I'm commenting on what to me has become a well established empirical reality. The fact is that to a self psychologist the basic principles and the basic facts are different. Is there a shared language? Is there a common discourse that can evolve? I hope so as much as everyone here. I'm simply telling you that in my 25 years in the field, I haven't seen it happen yet. Let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you about it. You, 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 you disapprove. I mean, I yours disagree. is a journal that I, would not. I more than disapprove. Yours is a journal that systematically refused to publish cohorts because its editor decided summarily that he was not an analyst. Cohen, Cohen never had a paper in Japan. Well, but Paul, I mean, it, it, that's, that wasn't Steve. I mean, you're right. That's that Japan was that way. Well, I, I, I guess my point, which is cautionary, is that just like analysts are so beautifully attuned to the weight of personal past, there is the issue of institutional history and institutional past. And I, I would suggest simply that I see a different side of it, or I see different manifestations of it among the people that I deal with day in and day out. May I say something about the science question before we stop? Um, it, the one you brought up a little while ago. We don't have a, a, a section on, um, uh, actually you didn't say science, you said research. And that's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a good differentiation to make. Um, we don't have a, a research section. And I think you probably don't get many submissions of that kind unless you do, because people need to know you right. have a specific interest. But we have gotten some, actually. 
We haven't ever accepted one. I, I have a background in, in many, many years ago in empirical research, enough so that I, I can evaluate a piece of research, and they just weren't good enough. Um, but I don't have any objection to, to publishing research, either quantitative or qualitative. The, the, the objection I have is the danger that quantitative research is privileged uh, and is given the power to make decisions about issues um, that I don't think it should be in, in psychoanalysis, especially uh, nomothetic research where you're talking about group differences just doesn't apply to a whole lot of individual treatments. So you, 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 you uh, publish both qualitative and quantitative Absolutely. research. I think both are interesting. They're interesting, though, because they're the perfectly valid means of creating knowledge. They're just not the bedrock of knowledge. They don't have to be looked at that way. Mm -hmm. before, before we stop, oh, Dr. Brenner, do you have any, anything to add to our discussion before we stop? You did. I'm just giving you an opportunity. Okay. It's interesting to me that a great deal of the discussion centered on the problems of science, of uh, professional journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, a great deal of the discussion uh, diverged from that, and we have to do with what is psychoanalysis, what it's all about, and so on. So it's interesting to listen to. And I think it reflects. What's, what has happened in, in, uh, in our profession, I wouldn't say our field, I would say our profession, that is that many people are struggling uh, to get straight in their minds or come to some conclusion, I guess would be a better way to say it, uh, as to what psychoanalysis means. so many different people in the field who say such different things about how the mind 